This series was funded by great viewers just like you over on Patreon. Check out the description or end of the video to hear how you can take part in making the show even more amazing. Hey everyone, Kaijin Goomba here, and welcome back to another episode of Witch Ninja, a series that looks at media's most popular shinobi to see which are good and which are bad. And this month's ninja is actually coming from a game that you guys in the comments section have been requesting for a long, long time. The third person free to play shooter, Warframe. For those of you a bit unfamiliar with the game, without spoiling too much, Warframe is essentially about the player character called Tenno, who uses various biomechanical suits called Warframes to complete their varied missions with numerous factions in the game's universe. But despite each Warframe having their own unique abilities and design, there is one consistent, fast, free-flowing movement and action as you expertly take down mobs of enemies. I mean, this is a game who unabashedly states as their motto, ninjas play for free, and damn if you don't feel like one. Yeah, but come on, are they really ninjas? I mean, they kind of look like beef jerky more than anything. Well, after spending over 100 hours in this game over the last couple of years, oh yeah, this game is incredibly ninja. From broad concepts like the game's missions, which have you going in either rescuing targets, assassinating a group of enemies, sabotaging locations, or even stealing highly confidential information, to the little things like being able to cling onto walls, or run and jump extreme distances, or gain bonuses for stealth takedowns. Well, that's fine, but that's not really holy ninja, is it? I mean, shoot, I've seen generic fantasy rogues in games do basically the same thing. So what actually gives Warframe the right to claim ninjas play free? Well, I could spend hours breaking down every minute detail of this game and how, despite being in a sci-fi setting, pulls hard from real-life shinobi history and culture. But I think the pinnacle of ninja representation this game has to offer comes in this one particular Warframe, Ash. Nah, I don't know about this guy. Looks more like the byproduct of Ridley Scott's alien after an aggressive relationship with a Ribros. Seriously, what am I even looking at here? I'll give you the fact that Ash's default appearance is neither ninja or anything really striking to look at, but it's the alternate skins where you can start to see a lot of inspiration from traditional ninja. I mean, just have a look at the Baihu skin. Isn't that the Chinese name for the White Tiger Guardian of the West? Okay, yeah, but have a close look at the helmet. Look familiar at all? Huh. I guess it kinda does look like a Hanya mask with its jawline, horn, and seemingly jutting fangs. Well, that's kind of a clever design. I mean, for the longest time, ninjas and Mia have had a long-running association with Hanya masks for... some... reason, I guess. Ah, but that's the thing. There is a reason. In theory, anyway. In my research, I've been digging around a lot of specific ninja schools, and there was one school that might contain the origin of this trope. The Kumogakure Ryu, or Hidden School of Ninja. The Kumogakure Ryu were famous for many things. Their non-violent espionage tactics, their jumping techniques, their use of Ippon Tsugi no Buri grappling hooks. But one of their most unique characteristics was their use of demon masks, which preyed on people's misconceived fear about ninjas and their magical capabilities. And while I haven't seen any Hanya masks specifically in association with ninja, I've seen plenty of other masks that are so similar in design, they might as well be. Next, there's the Tsukuyomi skin, which, despite being named after the Shinto god of moon and night, is- Aw, dude, he blew! And as we always say, Real Ninja Bear Blue! How fitting a name, considering the whole point of the black-blue design for a ninja was to camouflage with a moonlit night sky versus a solid black shozo. I mean, that and the whole belief that navy blue keeps pests away, but regardless, what a good choice! Oh, but that's not the end of it, because finally we have the Ash Koga skin. Yeah, as in the Koga Ryu Ninja Koga. Though at first glance, one might think this is more of a callback to Sam Fisher, another guy we should probably talk about in the show sometime, the Koga skin actually harkens back to the traditional ninja Shozoku, especially when it comes to the Ash Koga helmet, which looks a lot like an old-fashioned Zuking. Though modern media ninjas simply put on the equivalent of a ski mask these days, old-school Zuking hoods were actually comprised of a single piece of cloth 25 centimeters in width and freaking 2 meters in length. And as you might expect, after wrapping up the head and face in a tight mask, you'd likely have a decent amount of length left, which would then either be tied off and tucked in, or left running down the back. But over time, this small length of excess cloth somehow evolved into a full-blown scarf that takes its proportions way out of context, thus why the Koga helm has these two little dangling ribbons. Not to mention, the general shape of the helmet reflects the traditional Zukin as a whole. But I also noticed that not only does Koga Ash's thighs puff out like a ninja Hakama, they're also wearing the spitting image of a Suniate, essentially old Japanese armor shin guards. But here's the thing when it comes to this Warframe. 
it's not really Ash's appearance that make it a historically inspired ninja, but rather its abilities that it possesses. See, each Warframe has four different active abilities and a passive ability. And for Ash, those abilities are Shuriken, Smokescreen, Teleport, and Bladestorm, with its passive being a more powerful bleed effect. Oh, well I see where this is going. Mm, you may think these abilities are just basic stereotypes of ninja, but let's have a closer look. Starting with the first ability, Shuriken. Out of the four, this ability should be the most obvious, right? There's not really ever been a time in media where ninja's been without a shuriken. Nothing really inspired, right? Well, have a look at the specifics of this ability. Based on its rank, the shuriken ability allows Ash to toss one or two stars that deal 100 to 500 slash damage on a hit, with a 100% chance to bleed the target. Now each second the target bleeds, it deals a bit over 40% of the initial damage, while if you're able to hit the enemy in the head, it deals almost 90% of the initial hit. This might be an excruciatingly small detail, but it's one that absolutely links back to how real Shuriken worked for real ninja. Like we mentioned in our last video on Overwatch's Genji, Shuriken were not a tool used to kill, but rather to distract or inflict debilitations by coating the Shuriken in poisons and bacteria. It was about disabling and slowing down a target as the Shinobi made their escape, while the target itself would suffer from more severe damage over time from a coated Shuriken. Now, in comparison to Warframe, 100 to 500 damage is next to nothing at higher levels. Most people I know who play the game can do upwards of 10k damage in a single shot, but that bleed damage can go a long way. 500 initial damage plus another 200 over 9 seconds can total up to 2300, and if you can sink that star in an enemy skull, you can end up doing nearly 4600 damage. Basically, if you're getting chased down by an enemy in-game, you can launch a shuriken at their face and just run away while the poor sap bleeds to death. But what makes this so fascinating is that it mirrors the similar core principle of what Shuriken were supposed to do for the ninja. Not necessarily something that was immediately lethal, but rather a method of crippling your opponent as you try to get away, usually resulting in long-term damage or even death when it comes to the target. Like I said, a small detail to be sure, but I was really surprised at the technicality of this ability, and how it mirrored the real use of Shuriken versus mindlessly lobbing them at enemies in other games. Well, let's move on to the next ability, because honestly, Smokescreen shouldn't be a surprise to anyone. Just like a lot of games and movies depict, Smoke Bombs, or Torinoko as they were called, saw a lot of mileage when it came to Ninja. Quick flashes of light and gouts of smoke would typically buy a Ninja a handful of precious seconds they would need to escape. But some of you might be saying, well, these Torinoko you keep showing off have fuses, which couldn't be lit at a moment's notice, while Ash throws a bomb on the ground which causes an instant staggering explosion. How easy would it be for Ninja to make those? Well, the answer is pretty dang easy, actually. In fact, a quick YouTube search can show you how to make these in your own home. In our case, we learned how to make them from a popular guy named Kipke, who was able to make one in about, oh, three minutes. So check this out. Take a palmful of gravel and some silver fulminate, which you can get out of any brand of party popper. Mix in a small amount of gunpowder and powdered magnesium, which you can easily grind off a store-bought campfire starter. Toss in some sugar for a thick white smoke, wrap it up tight in a 5-inch paper cloth towel, and BOOM! You got yourself an impact smoke bomb. Granted, Ninja in the 13 to 1600s couldn't exactly go to their local Walmart and pick up these materials like we can today, but it wasn't outside the realm of possibility for Ninja to utilize these powders and metals given how deep their knowledge of metallurgy and chemistry ran. So yeah, not only does Ash's smokescreen ability reflect real Ninja history, but it's also one of the more simple for Ninja to execute. But how in the world do you explain this third ability, Teleport, where the Ash Warframe is able to dimension door behind their enemy in a split second? Like, how does that even work? Well, this ability is one part fact and one part fiction. While it is physically impossible for anyone to warp space-time to move dozens of feet in the blink of an eye like Ash can, a ninja didn't necessarily have to in order to achieve the desired effect. Oh, you mean the Shunshin no Jutsu? Exactly. The Shunshin no Jutsu, or blink of an eye art, was a sort of compounded technique ninja would use that would combine their quick reactions with their distracting capabilities. A ninja could quickly drop a Torinoko or toss a shuriken that would stagger their enemy's perception for just a few moments, and in conjunction with their quick reflexes, a ninja could be out the door in a matter of seconds, giving the illusion that the ninja just teleported a short distance away after the shinobi's target regained composure, thus the name Blink of an Eye Technique, cause Blink once in distraction and the ninja is gone. But come 1966 and the release of the movie Watari Ninja Boy, the technique took a more literal incarnation of teleportation similar to what we see Ash doing in Warframe, and is likely one of the key inspirations of this technique. Finally, there's Bladestorm, and even though it's Ash's most complicated ability, it's actually got one of the easiest to explain origins. Upon activating the ability, Ash targets a number of enemies in sight, 
each one consuming 12 some odd energy. And after hitting the ability button again, Shadow Copies of the Ashes Warframe pounces on each target inflicting upwards of 2,000 unmitigated damage and causing the opponent to bleed. The key word here is Shadow Copy, and to anyone who's watched this show before, you know what this is, I know what this is, say it with me now, Bushin no Jutsu, one of many Genjutsu or Phantom techniques in the ninja's repertoire. The Bushin no Jutsu or Division technique is created by having the shinobi create literal straw men dressed in their garb set in strategic places to throw off guardsmen, but is also executed by having several ninja dressed in the exact same garb work in close proximity with each other in tight coordination, giving the illusion that there's many ninja of one mind. As you might expect, this resulted in several confused guards who couldn't relay details of the intruder as there were several indistinguishable ninja in one place. Like I said, I could spend hours talking about the historic ninja origins of this game. Despite the unique sci-fi universe Warframe takes place in, there's countless other aspects I could take apart. Additional Warframes, NPCs, factions, and good, holy god, the dozens of weapons you can wield in this game. But Ash? Ash at its core is pure ninja, both based on historical technique and cultural legend. And I couldn't even fathom talking about Warframe on Witch Ninja without talking about it first. Which is why I'm giving Ash a hefty 9 out of 10 stars. The complete visual design and time period of Ash may be a little out of this world, but everything else is solid. How about you, my dude? I'm gonna go with a 6 out of 10 stars. I agree that there's a lot to take in historically and culturally with this guy, but if we're going for authenticity, Ash seems to take on a bit more of ninja legend rather than history. But you know, that's okay. This is a game about space ninja after all, so it's fine. Hey, that's a fair grade. But what do you guys think? Let me know in the comments below, and while you do that, I just want to say thanks for watching, and a big thanks to all our patrons who keep this show alive. And to every non-patron Warframe fan who's been waiting for this video, you need to thank them too. Where usually Tenno doesn't get the popular vote that often, this time he beat out Spider-Man by just one vote. So send him some love. Otherwise, if you're wanting to see the good, the bad, and the ugly when it comes to media's most popular ninja, be sure to check out the entire Witch Ninja series. We've done almost two years of videos now and many, many more on the way. For now though, I gotta get back to working on my special project. But until next time everyone, this is Gaijin Goomba, signing out.